Well, thank you for being here. I'm amazed you're here. Um, and thank you for coming to this session. Um, just to relieve any of you who may have suspicious minds, uh, when we do these sessions on things that we have written or recorded, it's only because we're told to do it. Um, and for some of us who uh, are not blessed with the American uh, perspective on existence, but have a, a Celtic melancholy running through our disposition, um, and know that our mother would have beat the living daylights out of us if we'd ever talked in public about anything that we ourselves had done, uh, you'll realize that there is a certain discomfort level in uh, talking to you this evening about the whole Christ. So, let me, let me set this in, a, in an autobiographical context, and then I'll set it in uh, an historical context. Um, there is a book here uh, published by Crossway called The Whole Christ. There is a, there's a DVD series here uh, called The Whole Christ. There's even a workbook here <laughs> called The Whole Christ. And there are questions in here that I, I just glanced at. I'm not sure I know the right answers to them all. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a little like these naive people who wrote textbooks uh, when some of us were younger, and the answers were all at the back of the book. The answers are all at the back of the book. So, you, you do not need to fear that Ligonier is giving you the third degree. Well, how does this book emerge in, in my own life? In uh, 19, I think I came to visit the United States for the very first time in 1980. To be honest, I never thought I would see the United States again. But then I was invited back to speak at a minister's conference in Indianapolis, which I knew. I knew my American geography because of the places where Arnold Palmer had played in golf tournaments. <laughs> so, I even knew where Greensboro, North Carolina was. And the only thing I knew about uh, Indianapolis was that's where the Indianapolis 500 was. And so, I came to this minister's conference, and I was invited to, to give three addresses on this subject, pastoral lessons from the Marrow Controversy, pastoral lessons from the Marrow Controversy. To be absolutely honest, I accepted the invitation so obviously a younger man than I am now, because it seemed such an honor to have the privilege of speaking to uh, other ministers. And I have a vivid recollection one day of my wife Dorothy bringing uh, a cup of coffee into my study when I was preparing for the conference, the week before the conference. And I remember looking up at her and saying, I don't know why I'm doing this, because there cannot be anybody in the United States of America who has even heard of the Marrow Controversy. But I came, and then one of those amazing providences uh, in life, I, I gave the addresses. They were recorded on cassettes. Um, and when I came to the United States thereafter, I hardly ever went anywhere without somebody coming up to me and saying, I've listened to your cassettes on the Marrow Controversy. It was, it was kind of like amazing that this should be so. And I think uh, in the next few minutes, I'll be able to explain to you why I think that was. Um, but thereafter, people said, you know, you should publish that. And uh, I thought, yeah, I should publish that. Uh, but it's one thing, as those of you who speak know, it's one thing to prepare for the immediacy of a service or a conference, which will be gone in a flash. It's a different thing to 
actually, it's a different thing to do the hard work of writing something. And so, the years passed, and people said, you should do that, you should do that. And then I, I was retried or retired or whatever it is, and I, I thought, you know, maybe I should try and do that. And that was the… that's why there is a book, and one thing led to another. So, one might say uh, there was like the screenplay of the Marrow Controversy in uh, 1980, and then there was the book of the screenplay, and then they made it into a movie, uh, and uh, then it became a course at uh, the Reformed Bible College, and it appears in all these different versions. They are not all the same. The book and the DVD series cover the same themes, but the DVD series uh, is not just uh, a ventriloquist telling you what's in, in the book. So, that's the relationship between these things. But what on earth, you might say, was the marrow controversy? Well, in the early 1700s uh, in Scotland, uh, there were all kinds of controversies, but one of them arose because of a question that candidates for the ministry were being asked in a particular presbytery in Scotland, in the, in the presbytery of Ochterarder. And those of you who are rich and famous and uh, have stayed in the Glen Eagles Hotel will know that area of the country. It's in the presbytery of Ochterarder. And the question that students who were seeking to be licensed and ordained were always asked was uh, whether it was orthodox doctrine to teach that we must forsake sin in order to our coming to Christ. Is it right and orthodox doctrine to teach that we must forsake sin in order to our coming to Christ? And in a way, it was really a trick question. It was, it was really meant to unearth whether people thought that there were certain qualifying marks you could attain in your life in order to prepare yourself for the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Those of you who are familiar with the Westminster Confession of Faith will remember how it emphasizes that it's not possible for an individual to do anything to prepare himself to come to Christ. And so, it was probing uh, these young men who were candidates for the ministry. And one of, them, uh, one of them gave his answer, and then the next month he decided that his answer had not really been uh, an answer of conviction. And the presbytery was willing to set him apart for the ministry. When he came back, they rescinded their decision. Their decision was appealed to the synod. The synod decision was appealed to the General Assembly, and it became a controversy in the whole Church of Scotland. Sitting in the assembly where the issue was decided, and the young man whose name was William Craig was, uh, in fact, exonerated at the assembly, sitting in the assembly there was a minister from down in the border regions of Scotland in a, in a very out-of-the-way place. Uh, his name was Thomas Boston. And he turned uh, at the end of the meeting to the man, the other minister who was sitting beside him, don't think they really knew each other, and he said, you know, on this whole issue of how the grace of God works in people's lives, and especially how do we preach the gospel to people? How if we are Calvinists who believe in sovereign predestination and election, how can we freely preach the gospel to all sinners. And Boston said, you know, I have found great help for myself in a book called The Marrow of Modern Divinity. And this man got so interested in the book, he got a copy, and uh, some of the ministers made arrangements for this book to be republished. It was a book written in the 17th century by a man called Edward Fisher. And uh, 
It's in the form of, a, of a, those of you who know Plato's dialogues, you know that different positions are represented by different individuals, a bit like Pilgrim's Progress. And the matter of modern divinity is a dialogue among four people. Uh, there is a new convert, there is a legalist, there is an antinomian, and then there is a wise pastor. And during the course of two volumes of The Marrow of Modern Divinity, there's a series of really significant theological and pastoral points discussed. One is the free offer of the gospel. How do people who believe in divine election and discriminating grace, how do they offer the gospel to the people to whom they preach? A second was the question of legalism. Uh, the great tendency uh, that uh, the Ochterarder presbytery was trying to resolve. What's the relationship between our works and God's grace? The third question was the issue of antinomianism, the kind of question that Paul raises in end of Romans 5, beginning of Romans 6, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Isn't the logic of that that if there is grace to cover all our sin, then it doesn't really matter uh, whether we slip or fall. There will always be grace to forgive us, and so there is a laxity in relationship to obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the middle of that, there was a question that was always important in the Reformed theological tradition, which was do all Christians enjoy the assurance of salvation? Do all Christians enjoy the assurance of salvation? And Thomas Boston had found this book very helpful to him. It wasn't that he agreed with every jot and tittle in it, but he found it so helpful in wrestling through these issues in a way that made a difference to his preaching. And in his autobiography, in his memoirs, he expresses that at one point in a very interesting way. He says that people told him they noticed the difference between his preaching and the preaching of most other ministers. The way he puts it is that there was a tincture, a tincture, a tincture of grace about his preaching, a tincture of Christ-centeredness, a tincture of Christ's absolute sufficiency to save all those who came to Him in faith. And the book, of course, became public knowledge. People started attacking the book. It was especially attacked because it uh, gave rise to the free offer of the gospel. It was attacked because people thought it was antinomian. It was attacked because uh, people thought it said every Christian enjoys the assurance of salvation. And it led to a great controversy in the church that uh, was named after the title of that book that Thomas Boston had actually found it on the window ledge of a parishioner's house when he was visiting him, and he'd taken it home, he'd borrowed it, he liked it so much uh, that he had bought it. And this controversy arose in the Church of Scotland over the marrow of modern divinity, and uh, eventually the denomination banned the book. So, ministers were forbidden to recommend that book in any way to their parishioners. And actually, as far as I know, that ban has never been lifted. It's been ignored often enough, but it's never been lifted. Boston himself produced an edition of it with marginal references and notes that is a great work of theology on its own. And uh, one of the well-known ministers of the next century once said to his theological students, because of the ban, I cannot recommend to you that you read The Marrow of Modern Divinity, but I urge you to read Thomas Boston's notes on The Marrow of Modern <laughs> Divinity, 
which shows that it's not only Jesuits who can be subtle, that Presbyterians uh, can be subtle as well. Now, let me try and bring together my own experience and I think what happened there uh, in the 1700s in Scotland and the controversy over the marrow of modern divinity. I said uh, earlier on that I, I found wherever I went, people would come up to me and say I was, I was helped. And I pondered the reason, and as I spoke to people, I think I discovered this, that so many Christians, serious Christians, struggle with the issue of the fullness of Jesus Christ as their Savior. If I can put it this way, uh, Kevin DeYoung said this in his, his message last night. Many people were listening to the preaching about Christ, and so they had their Christology clear, they had their soteriology clear, but they didn't really know Jesus Christ Himself in all His fullness. You have probably met people who every Sunday perhaps in your church, I've known people like this will stand up and happily recite the Apostles' Creed, believe every word of it. I remember a lady saying to me once, an elderly lady, that uh, most of the people she thought in the congregation believed she'd been a Christian since childhood, but she'd only recently become a believer. And I thought, this has happened to you. You never doubted a word of the creed or uh, the Christian confession, but you didn't realize it was all about a person. It was not a description of a system. It was a description of a person. And now you've come to know the person. And because you've come to know the person, you've come to an assurance of your salvation. And this was what Boston discovered. And one of the things that I think all those years ago impressed itself on me was this, and uh, it emerged in the addresses I gave e essentially from something I had noticed in the opening chapters of the Bible. That was what happened in the Garden of Eden, in the way in which the serpent tested and tempted Adam and Eve, and particularly Eve. Uh, you remember how the narrative goes. Um, so often I had read, what happens in the Garden of Eden is that the serpent attacks the authority and the inerrancy of God's Word. That's what happens. Now, that's true, but it dawned on me that while that is true, it's actually secondary to something else. And this fact very much goes along with the idea of preaching about Christ and preaching Christ. What happens in the Garden of Eden is not just that the serpent attacks the authority and inerrancy of God's Word. What the serpent does is to attack the character of God Himself. Why do I say that? because what the serpent says is not just an effort to deny the truth of God's Word, but to insinuate something about the character of God. And you know how that emerges. Did God set you in this magnificent garden, which has just been described in the previous chapters? Did He set you in this garden, and did He say to you, you are not to eat of the fruit of any of the trees in this garden? It is so significant as exegetes of Genesis 3 that we notice that question. All of these trees, all of this fruit, has God said to you, you are not to eat of the fruit of any of these trees. 
I think the way I put it way back there, because I knew about Macy's, I'm not sure whether Macy's is still in existence, but what was going on here was that the serpent was uh, describing God in these terms, like a father taking his child at Christmas time into a department store like Macy's and into the children's department and all the toys and showing him around all the toys and then taking his hand and saying to him with a serpentine-like voice, none of these is for you, son. None of these is for you. And this is the thrust of what happens. So, what is the purpose? The purpose is to persuade Eve that God is not fully, finally, truly, an infinitely good, kind, gracious, and generous Father. Now, why is that important when it comes to the law? Let me slide in something else here. Some of you will know the name of the great Dutch-American uh, biblical scholar, Gerhardus Voss. Gerhardus Voss says that the essence of legalism, listen to this, the essence of legalism, what would you say the essence of legalism was? Listen to Voss. The essence of legalism is to dislocate the law of God from the person of God. That's what was happening in the Garden of Eden. And if you trace that narrative through, you'll notice two very interesting things. That first of all, the serpent seeks to turn Adam and Eve into legalists. So, if God is not lavishing all this upon you, the implication is there is something you need to do in order to get into His better books. And eventually it works, except instead of at first turning them into legalists, it turns them into antinomians. And as I read that and wrestled with this, a little like Thomas Boston, it dawned on me that contrary to what we tend to think legalism and antinomianism are actually symptoms of one and the same disease, and that disease is a root cause, a suspicion of God, a mistrust of His character an inability to take in and to act upon the reality of His grace. And at that point, it dawned on me that that was a description of so many Christians I had met who deep down had some kind of grasp that Jesus loved them, but were not so sure about the Heavenly Father that there had been a dislocation, therefore, in their lives between the Father and the Son, and therefore there also had been a dislocation in their lives between the Father and His law. And so, there were many Christians who were inherently suspicious of and irritated by that law because they had dislocated it from a knowledge of God as the Heavenly Father. And it went hand in hand, as I noticed, with the way in which I'd often heard the gospel preached, which was this. God loves you, notice the fist. God loves you, meaning the Father, because Christ died for you. That's the gospel. And the truth of the matter is, that's almost a reversal of the gospel, isn't it? but you see what it insinuates into our minds. If the reason the Father loves us is because the Son died for us, then without the Son dying for us, the Father would never have loved us. And therefore, somehow or another, the Son, by what He did, persuaded the Father to love us. And it, it's incredible, but it's true that the verse that says the very reverse of that is what? 
John 3, 16. God in John 3, 16 is a reference to the Father, because the antecedent of Son in John 3, 16 is the Father. The Father so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that, therefore, was the key to dissolving in the hearts of believers both legalism and antinomianism. And that, therefore, the remedies that had often been used in the evangelical church, an antinomian, you know, sprinkle in some legalism and they'll be fine, or a legalist, sprinkle in a little antinomianism, don't take the law so seriously, would never produce spiritual health but the knowledge of the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ would provide the pharmaceutical that would dissolve both legalism and antinomianism and lead to a happy bondage to the love of the Heavenly Father, demonstrated, as Paul says in Romans 5, in the death of His Son and sealed in our hearts by the gift of the Holy Spirit and that when this was grasped, therefore, the believer would live in a happy communion and fellowship with God, and that if that legalism or antinomianism were in the heart of the preacher, it would very soon be in the minds and hearts of his hearers, and that what people noticed about Thomas Boston's preaching, therefore, that brought them so much spiritual deliverance was that he had grasped this secret and his preaching of Christ and the fact that Christ demonstrated. He didn't wrestle from the Father his love. He demonstrated in his atoning death how profoundly the Father loves us. And this was the heart of the gospel. And so many Christians, don't you? experience believe that the, the evidence that God loves them is that things are going really well in their lives. And so, what happens when things are not going well? The gospel, the gospel does not say the demonstrate… God has demonstrated His love towards you in that while you're a sinner, things are going well for you. But the Father demonstrated His love for you. The Father demonstrated His love for you. Get behind me, Satan. The Father demonstrated His love for you, Romans chapter 5, in that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you, and that this was therefore the root of the free offer of the gospel. It was the pharmaceutical that would bring healing for legalism and antinomianism in the heart, and as a result of both, bring the assurance of salvation. So, that's all somewhere tucked away in these many manifestations, these three manifestations of the whole Christ. Thank you for listening.